Greetings, I'm especially honored to be here in as much as you named this building after my little company, Energy Innovation. So, um, What I want to do is pick up the gauntlet that Mayor Peduta tossed down yesterday. He asked the following question, if you assembled a city with the vast resources that Pittsburgh had and put behind it political commitment and the academic resources we have here and the amazing philanthropy and the vibrant private sector, what could you deliver? So I'm going to offer four challenges for Pittsburgh. Before I say that, before I get into it, I want to say I, I grew up in the Silicon Valley. Or I went to college at Stanford, and I've worked with uh, venture capital groups, technologists ever since. And I have seen the power of innovation in an innovation ecosystem. Dramatic things can happen. Innovation is an inexhaustible resource. But it requires a, a focus and an, a, and an intention in order to prosper. It requires the participation of all those actors in society. And I think Pittsburgh's ideally positioned to do that, not just for Pittsburgh, but for the world. So let me jump into it. Um, just a couple words of context. This will be no surprise to anyone in the world, but it's time for us to move, it's time for us to kick the fossil fuel habit. This is the tar sands in Canada. I've flown all over them. Thousands and thousands of acres. An area the size of Florida is now zoned for this kind of destruction. And here's the alternative. These things run forever. They don't emit anything. These are solar panels. Five years ago, I could not have stood here and tell you that a fossil-free future is feasible. But look what's happened just in those five years. We've seen this incredible rise of new clean technologies, and with them, an incredible price drop. Solar has grown tenfold in the last four years. The price has dropped 80% for solar PV panels. Wind in the last eight years has dropped almost 60%. Light emitting diodes, these super great lights, have dropped more than 80% in price. And the upshot is that a fossil free future costs the same as a fossil intensive future. This is what I could not have said five years ago. There's a fantastic new study out called The New Climate Economy that goes through this in some detail. So if it costs the same to build this fossil free future, uh, it should happen, but it won't happen without the kind of innovation we need and without the kind of political intensity to drive the adoption of these innovations we need. This slide here compares the total costs, capital costs and operating costs, of clean technologies above the line and conventional technologies below the line. And the point is several of them have crossed the line. It is now cheaper in about half the world to install zero carbon technologies than carbonaceous technologies. That's an amazing inflection point. That's the change that we need. So what does that mean for Pittsburgh, and what are the challenges that we have for us? The first thing that has to be recognized is that the human future is an urban future. Just about four years ago was the first time in human history when more than half the people lived in cities. Essentially, all the new population growth in the world is landing in the cities. And the cities drive economic output. Not surprisingly, as this slide shows, that's also where, carbon is where energy is consumed and where, therefore, carbon is emitted, either directly or by induced demand. So we win in the cities or we lose in the cities. In the industrialized West, that means reinventing the cities. In China, it means getting them right in the first place. Plus, there's a fair amount of reinvention that's required. Um, it doesn't mean that cities become self-sufficient or that there's enough solar panels and gardens in the neighborhood to run the place. <clears throat> there's a symbiosis between the rest of the country and the cities. But the decisions we make here and the political force we apply here and emphatically the innovation that we develop and promulgate from here is going to be what drives it. So I'm going to offer four challenges for your consideration. By the way, this is not a picture of Pittsburgh. This is a Tianjin which is a little city of 12 million people near Beijing. And they have, they're determined to be the most environmentally friendly city on the planet. I think Pittsburgh better beat them. So these are the four challenges I, I put for your consideration. Go to zero energy in buildings. Phase out fossil fuels. Learn to be the leaders in optimizing systems, which I'll get into in a minute, and rethink urban patterns. I put these up here because these are the megatrends that we need in order to land at a reasonable carbon future, because they require a lot of innovation, and because Pittsburgh is incredibly suited to do each of these things. If Pittsburgh 
consciously built an innovation culture around any one of these goals, it would own it the same way the Silicon Valley owns software or Research Triangle Park owns medical technologies. It could be incredibly prominent economic engine for the city and a prominent gift to the world. Um, let me start with the first one, net zero energy buildings. Buildings are old technologies, and they're essentially dumb technologies. There are no economic actors organized to optimize buildings. They don't exist. Architects can't do it. Developers can't do it. The people that make glass don't make insulation. Those people don't make structural elements. Those people don't make HVAC. It's a fragmented industry, and it's walking away from amazing potential. We now have the technology to make all residences and most commercial buildings near net zero energy. It's an official goal of the state of California that all new residences become net zero energy by 2020 and commercial by 2030. That's a pretty big deal. But who's going to drive that innovation? There's a lot to it. I've listed some building envelope technologies. Windows have this low emissivity coating that you can tune to the orientation and tune to the climate. And a good window is as good an insulation as a good wall. Or a net solar heater if you're in a cold country. Or a net cooler if you're in hot country. You can have building integrated photovoltaics. There's a whole suite of technologies that have been essentially ignored. I know at Carnegie Mellon University, I think, has the, the best building sciences program in the country. It's a fantastic opportunity. Volker Harkov there. Yes, indeed. Brilliant man. It's not just what you do with the envelope, of course. It's also the possibility of rethinking the energy mix that supplies the building and that moves it around. And there are fantastic opportunities there. Um, and then there's this whole new thing that's happening. That little thermostat, there's a Nest thermostat. Who's got one of those? So you put this $250 gizmo on your wall, and your building energy goes down 15%, just like that. And all it is is a switch and a radio and a little bit of cuteness, right? So if you can reduce the energy consumption in a building by 15% by putting that on the wall and letting it do its homework and letting it talk to the cloud and letting it learn about the weather and letting it learn about your building all by itself, there's something going on. But where is the center for innovation on optimizing buildings? Globally. Here, if anywhere. Buildings is an enormous industry and there is nobody organized to drive that as a new thing. From a policy perspective, it means that the city of Pittsburgh should drive towards net zero energy buildings. The best building code in the world, as far as I know, is California's for this simple reason. It automatically gets tighter every three years. It was signed into law when Jerry Brown was the youngest governor of California. It has not been changed since. He's now the oldest governor in California's history. And our buildings use 80% less energy, new ones, compared to pre-code buildings, right? So this is a winnable deal. All right, next challenge. Phase out fossil fuels. This is where I began. Because of the incredible advances in technology on the energy consuming side to make the world more efficient and on the energy supply side to live without carbon, we have the opportunity now to phase out fossil fuels. But I'm telling you, it's not just a matter of building PV panels and windmills. It requires one to rethink the grid altogether, the electric utility grid. Why? This is a picture, that top green line there is California's load on a typical January day in 2020. And you can see the load goes up and down, uh, depending on when people wake up and they turn on their toasters and they go to work and they come home and they watch TV and they do all that stuff. The line under it, this is called the duck curve because it's supposed to look like a duck, is what happens to California's load after you put the solar in. And what happens to it is it plummets from about the net load plummets from about 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock when the sun comes up, or 9.30. And then at about 4 o'clock till 7 p.m., it skyrockets again. And to give you a sense of scale, that skyrocketing of 13,500 megawatts, that's 13 and a half huge nuclear plants equivalent that have to be turned on and run for two hours and turned off again. And fossil power plants hate thermal cycling. They hate to be turned on and turned off. So you need to solve this variability problem with renewables, or you run into a wall. And the wall happens somewhere between 25 and 40 percent of renewables. So we're now in a position where we can win this one. We can drive towards a zero carbon grid much more quickly, much more cheaply than anybody will 
acknowledge almost anybody, but not unless we solve this problem. So who's organized to solve this problem? And how do we solve this problem? Quickly, because I have four minutes and 59 seconds left. The first thing people instinctively come to is storage. You create energy in the day and you use it at night, therefore you need a battery. And storage is great, but we're not going to have anywhere near enough storage to solve this problem. And the good news is you don't need storage. I've got infrastructure up there. If you have good transmission lines and you use them intelligently, the whole problem smooths out dramatically. Seattle and San Diego never have the same power supply or power demand. So hook them together and let them help each other a little bit. The second one is demand response. I like to say we have 100 million large-scale batteries already in America that we're not using. They're called buildings. And they're thermal batteries, not electrical batteries. But you put in those smart thermostats, you can pre-cool your buildings on a hot day. You can adjust the temperature within a couple degrees so people don't notice, and you totally balance out the variability of sunshine and wind. So who's in charge of that? Who's doing that? What utility is properly organized to capture the demand side of the equation and match it, hook it up with the supply side of the equation? It's a huge economic opportunity. It's fantastic. It requires switches, radios, data, and intelligence. Those are cheap. Those are high value. Those are things Pittsburgh's equipped to deliver to the world. There's a few more things you have to do. You use natural gas to ramp up and ramp down quickly. Use it for power, not for energy that drastically reduces the CO2 emissions and the environmental impacts, but helps balance your system. And it's cheap. Those turbines are there. The pipes are there. Just use them differently. So this is how you phase out fossil fuels. What does it mean politically? It means that the big purchasers of energy here need to ask, need to sit down with your utilities and say, let's work through a transition together. And it means the state of Pittsburgh, sorry, close, the state of Pennsylvania, I know you guys are not a state yet, just a city. Um, the state of Pennsylvania needs to demand ever larger, continuously increasing fractions of renewable energy from the power companies. And the political power to do that rests here and rests in that other city on the eastern side of the state. OK, challenge three, system optimization. Two boring words, one exciting concept. The inventors in America are incredibly good at device optimization. Incredible engines, pumps, light bulbs, windows, but we have very few people in charge of system optimization. And I talked about buildings as a system. No one's in charge of optimizing it. Talk about the utility as a system, considering the demand side and the supply side, considering all these new information and control technologies we have. Who's in charge of optimizing that? Nobody. We now have the technologies through sensors, through control systems, through communication systems, through big data to optimize systems, and it is the dramatic frontier, I'm telling you, dramatic frontier in energy efficiency and in using resources more efficiently. So system optimization is a new thing. And again, here's Volcker's building here. It requires a new kind of thinking, a new kind of discipline pulled together in a problem-solving orientation. OK, my last one, and this will be familiar to many people here. It's rethinking urbanization. The old modalities of spread out suburbs don't work in a creative, purpose-driven world. The millennials are moving out of the suburbs into the cities. People are driving less, not more, for the first time in history. And what people want is not mobility. They want access. And you can get access by going somewhere, but you can also get access by rethinking what your city textures look is like. Make it mixed use. And there are zoning opportunities, there are transportation opportunities, there are ways to create these creative clusters that give people that meet human needs much more fully than isolated suburban houses. And that's part of revitalizing a city. We have to reinvent America to do that. So this is my challenge, these four challenges, I'll, I think I've got them summarized here. I did not summarize them. But these four challenges for Pittsburgh, these are realms that are accelerating they are realms that offer incredible potential for cleaning up the world. They will take advantage of your vibrant private sector, your incredible academic resources, the philanthropic backup, and the political commitment that exists here. But they need that purpose, they need that drive to become that ecosystem for you. So, thank you.
Bon. Realistically, how good are these guys? I mean, where are they at in the transition map? The Pittsburghians? Yeah. There, there may be some issues we want to avoid on this stage, but yes. in general, <clears throat> on the positive side of the energy transition, how, how far are they advanced down the road? On several topics, emphatically with buildings, I would say, and rethinking and rebuilding an industrial city, yeah. farther ahead than almost anyone, but not near enough to lead the world the way it needs to go. These, these frontiers are much bigger than most people realize. Do you think it's going to be the public sector or the private sector or some other non-governmental actors that are going to trigger the big shift right now? There's an alchemy that happens. Right. And if you look at innovation ecosystems like Research Triangle Park right. or Silicon Valley, it requires this joint force. And I don't mean that in a soft way. You need policy that demands change. Right. You need policy that reshapes the urban form by changing zoning. But as soon as you do that, you also need to encourage, you need to have the academic and the private sector focus behind it. The, the correct answer, I think. Okay, thanks, Hal. Great, thanks very much. Brilliant, thank you so much.